All right, I will get started right away. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a genetic counselor uh, for all of NCI, um, but I really have the honor of working very closely with Dr. Hassan, Dr. Gafour, and the A-team, um, Kathy Maria Tenen, <laughs> shout out to you. Um, We've heard a lot about mesothelioma today already, but I just want to emphasize that all cancer is genetic. Um, and I say that because some patients come to me and say, I don't have the genetic kind. Um, all cancer is genetic. When it comes down to it, it's just about our genes and if there's an issue, if there's some kind of misspelling there. So in order to explain this concept a little better, as a genetic counselor, I like to break up big concepts into small pieces. So. Um, you know, our bodies are made up of billions of cells. Every single cell has a nucleus. The nucleus is what contains all of our genetic information. And so that genetic information is called DNA. And I always call DNA our body's instruction manuals. Um, it's there to tell our bodies what to do, how to function, how to grow. Um, and so it's very important that our DNA is written correctly so those instruction manuals can work and our bodies can do what they need to do. Um, our genes, uh, our, our DNA is um, basically divided into little segments called genes, um, and we have over 23,000 different genes in every single cell times two, one from mom and one from dad. And so like I said, we want those genes to be spelled correctly um, in order for them to do their job. Um, and so this picture is just a, a fragment of DNA um, made up of four letters, A's, C's, T's, and G's, um, and you can see that, you know, if this sentence is supposed to say the gray cat ran down the hall, but we have a small little spelling error that makes it say the gray cat ran down the ball, that's a big enough difference that the message to the body is different, right? And so either that gene doesn't do what it's supposed to or that gene doesn't get transcribed or, or read at all, and that's a problem. So all cancer is actually caused by mutations. But are mutations acquired or are they inherited? That's a question that comes up. And so acquired mutations are mutations that occur during a lifetime. All cancer is due to acquired mutations, but people that get sporadic cancers um, get that cancer because of only acquired mutations that happen during a lifetime. And so we know that environmental factors we're all exposed to, right? Nobody can help it. We all live on planet Earth and we're all constantly being bombarded by different factors in our environment. Um, when we think about mesothelioma, we think about asbestos exposure as one potential thing. Um, but uh, basically, it, it's, it's something that um, happens during our lifetime, and we find acquired mutations in tumors. Um, so somatic testing or tumor testing is going to look for mutations that occur sporadically during a person's life and it's really uh, something that's performed during, at the time of your biopsy or at the time of surgery. That's when they take a, a small slice of the tumor and they do this particular kind of analysis. So really tumor testing or somatic testing um, is really used to look directly at that tumor, nothing else, but just at that tumor and see if there are spelling errors there. What are the genes that got messed up along the way? What are the genetic pathways that are relevant and, and cause that cancer? And so the future of medicine, we hope, is to be able to actually use those tumor test results to say, okay, what are the drugs or treatment options that would best target that genetic pathway? So that's really the reason why tumor testing has become so integrated in, into people's care. And most cancers that happen actually happen um, in this way, just sporadically. They happen because of a combination of genetic and environmental factors. So 90 to 95% of cancers are just sporadic cancers. On the other end, there's inherited cancer. So as a genetic counselor, I'm always looking for what are the chances that this cancer could be inherited versus sporadic. Um, I look at factors like early onset disease. I look at, uh, you know, was that person diagnosed with more than one primary cancer? Are there effect multiple affected generations? And so when I'm asking those questions, I'm interested in germline genetic testing. So inherited mutations or germline mutations are found in every single cell of the body. So we're not focusing on just that tumor anymore, but just every cell of the body. 
And so germline testing looks for mutations that would have been inherited at birth from a parent. And we perform this testing on blood or saliva because that would be representative of every cell of your body. And when we're looking at germline mutations, it's a little bit different from looking at mutations that occur in a tumor because that's, germline mutations are giving us information not just about that cancer or that tumor. It's telling us about a gene that's not written correctly and therefore could have implications for all different types of cancers. And when I talk about inherited cancers, really I'm talking about a minority of cases. Five to 10% of all cancers happen in this inherited fashion. So to just hammer this in a little bit, um, somatic mutations are only found in the tumor, and that means that there's no potential for passing on those mutations to the next generation. Whereas germline mutations are present in every cell of the body, and that includes your reproductive cells, so eggs, sperm, and therefore it makes it um, possible to pass it to the future generation. This is adapted from a study by um, Dr. Hassan's group at NCI and University of Chicago. Um, many years ago, they took a cohort of mesothelioma patients and wanted to see, are, is there a hereditary component to mesothelioma? Because in the past, it was really attributed to asbestos mainly. Um, but when they performed genetic tests, germline genetic testing on these patients, they found that about 12% actually carried a mutation in an important DNA repair gene. And out of that 12%, most of those mutations were in a gene called BAP1. So we know that if there's a mutation or a spelling change in the BAP1 gene, it can cause a syndrome called BAP1 tumor predisposition syndrome. The reason for that is because BAP1 is a really important gene in our bodies. It's actually what we call a tumor suppressor gene. So that means that its whole job is actually to prevent tumors from forming. It works to, to suppress tumors our whole life. And so you can imagine that if you have a spelling change in, in an important tumor suppressor gene, uh, you just don't have as much protection in place as you should. And so we tend to see cancers happening in places where BAP1 is supposed to be working really hard, where it's supposed to be active. So it causes a cancer predisposition syndrome in those specific spots. And like any other hereditary cancer syndrome, we see cancers happening at earlier ages than we would in the general population. And this tends to be about 20 years earlier than we would see uh, normally. So specifically, the cancers that we see in BAP1 tumor predisposition syndrome, um, malignant mesothelioma, unfortunately, is uh, the highest risk in this syndrome. And you know, as opposed to the general population where pleural mesothelioma is most common, We've heard today um, from a couple of speakers about how peritoneal mesothelioma is, is a lot of times associated with BAP1. Um, so a, about 50% of BAP1 patients uh, have each of these types. And the lifetime risk within the syndrome it can be up to about 30%. The next most common uh, cancer in the syndrome is uveal melanoma, so cancer of the eye because BAP1 tends to be very active in the eye. We think that, uh, according to the literature, it could be up to about a 28% lifetime risk for uveal melanoma. BAP1 is very important in the skin. It's very active there. So cutaneous melanoma is um, an, an increased risk, along with other skin cancers like basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. Renal cell cancer or kidney cancer is another risk with BAP1 tumor predisposition syndrome because BAP1 is also very active in the kidney. We think it's about a 7 to 9% increased risk. And meningiomas, or tumors of the central nervous system, um, the brain and the spinal cord, can be seen at a higher, um, a higher percentage in, in BAP1. There are other cancers that we're seeing um, an elevated risk for, including cholangiocarcinoma, bladder cancer, and, and breast cancer. There are even benign findings that we see in BAP1 tumor predisposition syndrome. Um, the name for this has changed about five times <laughs> over the years, but the most um, current name is BAP1 inactivated melanocytic tumors. Um, and these are uh, just dome-shaped raised papules that are flesh-colored, uh, don't really cause um, sensitivity to touch or temperature. Um, and these are, are things that uh, have been found to be present in most BAP1 carriers. So this study done in 2017 found that um, 
75% of BAP1 germline carriers who underwent a total body exam had at least one of these BIMTs uh, found on their exam. Um, so it's, it is highly predictive of BAP1's carrier status. And in this study of the dermatology patients found to have these BIMTs on clinical exam, about 51% were found to carry a germline mutation. So it's actually become a really interesting and great way for dermatologists to pick up carriers in otherwise asymptomatic patients. Um, for the interest of time, I'm just going to fly through that. Um, how is this inherited? It's autosomal dominant. That means that all first-degree relatives have a 50% chance of inheriting it. This um, chart you've probably seen before, but basically it's showing that dad has his two copies of his, let's say, BAP1 gene, and one copy is, is fine, one copy has a mutation in it. Mom is the unaffected um, parent, and she has two working copies. So every time they come together to have a child, there's a 50% chance that dad could have passed on that copy of the gene with the mutation, or a 50% chance he could have passed on the copy that was working fine. And so that's why uh, it's a 50% chance at every birth. It's like flipping the coin every time. So if you have 10 siblings, it doesn't mean five will have it and five won't. It means that nine could have it and one not, or vice versa. It's really flipping the coin every single time. And there is an increased risk for multiple cancers during a lifetime. So I get this question a lot. You know, I, I was diagnosed with this cancer. Does that mean I'm done? Unfortunately, no. Um, patients with BAP1 mutations do have a higher risk of having multiple cancers because every single cell um, doesn't have one of their copies working. So they're more susceptible. And different family members within the same family may get different types of BAP1-associated cancer. So that's another question I get often. You know, my family doesn't have renal cell cancer, so does that mean that I'm not at risk for renal cancer? And unfortunately, no. We have to screen all BAP1 carriers in the same way, assuming they're all at risk for all the cancers. I just put this out here to um, emphasize that there is a technology available for any hereditary cancer syndrome, including BAP1. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is a technology that uses IVF in conjunction with genetic testing. Um, so uh, IVF um, and then at the embryonic level, uh, cells are biopsied and genetic testing is performed. And only the embryos that do not carry the familial mutation will actually go on to be implanted for a potential pregnancy. It can be very, very difficult for patients to learn about a hereditary cancer syndrome. So I could go on and on for hours, and some of my patients out there know that I can talk for hours. Um, but I'm just kind of laying out there and acknowledging that these are so many of the issues that we talk about with our families. It's a relatively rare syndrome with less available resources, which can make it really difficult. Patients need support in coping with anxieties associated with lifelong cancer screening. I heard the word scanxiety out there, and that, that is a real thing. Guilt associated with passing cancer risk to children, um, of course, as a parent, you know, that tends to be the most important thing. There's something called survivor's guilt in family members who do not inherit a familial mutation, but they see other family members, um, you know, suffering from these diseases. There's fear of passing cancer risk to children leading to changes in family planning because the truth is reproductive technologies are not really available to everybody. It's not the most accessible thing, unfortunately. There's a huge burden of informing relatives about this. Um, you'd be surprised um, you know, how separated some families are and how, how difficult this can be um, to talk about. And I've heard it today, and I've heard it a million times. There's a common feeling of responsibility to educate providers who just don't know a lot about BAP1 in local communities. So we're, we're hoping to help with that. So to drill down some points and pass it to Dr. Gafour, when to seek germline genetic testing. Um, I really do recommend all mesothelioma patients to consider <laughs> genetic testing. I think you've heard several times today, and I've showed you that you know, a significant portion are associated with important DNA repair genes, and so it can have important clinical implications and, and can affect your management. BAP1 mutations are most likely to be found in patients who develop early onset mesothelioma and or have more than one BAP1-associated tumor. 
and the highest risk is in mesothelioma patients with a family history of meso or uveal melanoma or kidney cancer? And how can it make a difference? Um, there are huge benefits to doing genetic testing. As Dr. Gafour will, will talk about, it may allow providers to consider a specific treatment or management plan. It can provide important prognostic information. It can alert patients to a higher risk for other cancers and allow for proactive screening. Proactive screening then leads to early detection when treatments are most effective. And then it can really allow family members the chance to undergo genetic testing themselves to understand if they are also at risk and need extra screening. And finally, allow family members to um, use reproductive technologies if they're available to them to prevent transmission. Thank you. Okay, sure. So you just use that. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to give you a disclosure. I have a little bit of cough, so bear with me. Uh, my name is Azam Gafur. I'm an assistant research physician at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda. Uh, and I'll extend uh, Alex's talk talking about the treatment strategies and surveillance guidelines for patients with inherited and acquired uh, genetic mutations in mesothelioma. Uh, so as we know, um, acquired, as Alex had mentioned, acquired mutations that are, are found in the tumor of mesothelioma, the genomic landscape um, has been defined in many studies, um, and uh, what we are finding is that the genomic landscape is defined in mutations in uh, what Alex was mentioning, tumor suppressor genes, and this actually leads to the loss of the gene and the protein. Um, and there was one study in 2022 which looked at about over a thousand uh, tumor samples um, in patients with mesothelioma, and they found about 19 or so uh, uh, genetic mutations in these genes. Um, as you see here in the pie graph on the left, BAP1, NF2, CDKN2A, and CDKN2B were the more common ones. Um, and Going further, we uh, looked at some of the data at the NCI with Dr. Hassan and his group, and we actually broke it down between pleural and peritoneal disease. And when we sequenced about a few hundred patients, we found also similar picture that BAP1, TP53, NF2 to be signi significantly mutated. Uh, and that's here on the right-hand side. And this, re this confirmed prior studies in 2016, you see on the left side, um, of BAP1, the circles are representing, the, the size of the circle is representing the frequency of the mutations. And you see here on the left, BAP1 with the, with the largest circle being the most, uh, the most significantly mutated uh, gene in the tumor, followed by NF2 and TP53. And these are all tumor suppressor genes. So why do I mention this? Um, well, they do carry some prognostic and treatment decisions. Um, and First of all, the bottom line is that as of right now, we, there is no actionable mutations for somatic mutations. These are mutations that are found in the tumor of mesothelioma. However, there are some exceptions. We know prognostically BAP1 in the tumor, uh, loss of BAP1 in the tumor, also called the somatic mutation, may have longer survival when pa with, compared to patients that have an unmutated uh, BAP1. Um, and they may respond favorably to chemotherapy. This was, fall, this was described in a, um, a retrospective study that we uh, wrote an editorial, and you can see the citation there. TP53, which is another commonly uh, mutated uh, uh, gene in mesothelioma, unfortunately is non-targetable. Um, this is known as the guardian of the genome. It's a very important uh, gene in uh, maintaining uh, tumor suppression. Um, as of right now, there's no uh, treatment for this type of mutation. Going on to NF2, 
NF2, um, some of you might know that it's associated with other tumors like neurofibromatosis, that's where it gets its name. Um, in mesothelioma, um, it has been correlated with a shorter overall survival. Um, unfortunately, there's no approved therapy to target this uh, mutation. However, there is an ongoing uh, clinical trial. Um, as you see here, there's a phase one study, which is evaluating this drug called VT3989. Um, and this is a trial open for all solid tumors, but it does include mesothelioma. Uh, this year, they had some preliminary results showing about a a 10% response rate uh, with this drug. And finally, I include ALK. ALK is another important gene. Um, it is not as frequently mutated than the BAP1 and TP53, but we know that in a subset of peritoneal mesothelioma patients, they may have uh, a genomic alteration called a rearrangement. Um, and why that is important is actually we do have a drug that targets this type of alteration, and we adopt it from the lung cancer world. So in our clinic, if someone is young and they have peritoneal mesothelioma, we routinely check for ALK translocation uh, because of its predictive uh, um, uh, of, uh, implications. So switching on to germline or hereditary mutations in mesothelioma, these are genes that you, as Alex was mentioning, that you've inherited uh, one copy from your, uh, one of your parents. And we know that um, from the NCI cohort and uh, the University of Chicago, when, uh, about 12% of patients with mesothelioma can harbor a germline mutation in a DNA uh, repair enzyme. These are very important uh, genes that involve in um, repairing your DNA and all your cells. What we found was that BAP1 uh, was very commonly uh, mutated in, in our cohort. So what does that mean prognostically and treatment-wise? If you look on the left-hand side, um, you, you see the, um, this is showing that the overall survival of patients with BAP1 compared to um, patients without BAP1. So there was, uh, if you look at the, the left-hand side, the, the, the yellow uh, checked line are patients uh, with BAP1 mutated mesothelioma, and you see a nice clear separation in terms of survival when compared to a, a cohort of patients um, from the SEER database. So as you see here, patients, what we typically know who um, with mesothelioma, they may have survival two to three years, but with BAP1, they can survive more than five years, even up to 10 years. So clearly they have a better overall survival than uh, BAP1 wild type or non-mutated. On the right side, we looked at BAP1 patients who were treated with chemotherapy, and this is from uh, Dr. Hassan's work, um, and we found that patients, when we looked at the survival uh, that's uh, plotted on the x-axis, this is on the right-hand side here, we found that patients with a germline mutation in one of the DNA repair enzymes actually have a a better survival when compared to no mutation. And these are patients who were treated with chemotherapy. So what this is summarizing, what this is showing is that BAP1 patients in their germline that have this mutation not only live longer on average, but also uh, when they're treated with chemotherapy, they have a better survival. So given all that data I presented, how should, we, how should BAP1 patients be managed uh, medically? So we always counsel patients on the improved overall survival. I think that's very important. Why, this, why that is important is because not all patients require intervention. We may adopt a wait and watch approach um, by scans every six to 12 months. And we always involve our surgeons, our thoracic and our abdominal peritoneal uh, surgeons, because tumors may arise in different compartments in the body. You may have developed tumors in one chest or both chests or tricompartmental, which may include both chests and the abdomen. And rather than these being metastasis, these are actually different uh, primary tumors and different originating tumors. So they may be dealt with surgery or local therapy rather than systemic therapy. However, there are some scenarios where we may favor chemotherapy, and that's mostly individualized. And lastly, the significance of BAP1 is that we like to enroll our BAP1 patients on surveillance programs. 
And that is because, as Alex has mentioned, they are at risk of developing numerous other cancers, and also their family members are also uh, at risk for developing cancers as well. So I'll sort of shift gears and talk about our, about our screening trial at the NCI for BAP1 patients. This is a natural history and cancer screening protocol for mesothelioma patients and family members with a BAP1 gene. And you can see the clinicaltrials.gov identifier there. So BAP1 syndrome, we know loss of BAP1 has been studied internationally in families. There is a higher likelihood of different cancers. As Alex had mentioned, mesothelioma, you have your skin melanomas, ocular melanomas, and other solid tumors, including breast, renal, and others. We know that tumors, uh, BAP1 with this syndrome is, uh, is an autosomal dominant syndrome. So as Alex had mentioned, about you have a 50% risk of developing uh, the, can uh, the syndrome. And um, it does uh, affect every generation. And we know that rates of mesotheliomas increase in this population with an earlier onset of presentation. So since BAP1 patients are at risk for multiple malignancies, there was an unmet need to screen these patients and their immediate family members. So we developed this protocol at the NCI uh, that it's a surveillance protocol. And hopefully our goal is to determine the frequency and incidence of malignancies and also develop treatment plans for early intervention. The primary objective was to look at the natural history of patients and family members, and also define the risk of developing mesothelioma and, other, and define screening guidelines. We essentially have two cohorts of patients who are eligible. We have patients with mesothelioma and harbor a germline mutation in BAP1 or in another DNA repair enzyme. Again, these are germline mutations. And then cohort two involves first or second degree relatives of patients from cohort one who have germline mutation. And all patients are seen by Alex, our genetic counselor. And this is the study schema for the long-term follow-up. Eligible patients who have a history of mesothelioma and a, a pathologic germline mutation, um, or they have a first or second degree relative um, from cohort one. They are evaluated by Alex, and they're offered saliva or blood testing to test for an hereditary cancer, uh, a genetic mutation. And then at baseline, they're offered different um, consultations. We do an ophthalmology consultation to look for ocular melanomas. We have our patients see the dermatologist, so they can do a thorough skin exam. And what we're looking for are melanomas of the skin, and other non-melanoma skin cancers. As Alex had mentioned, you're at risk, there are at risk for basal cell carcinomas, and also these benign skin tumors, what we call BIMTs. And then we do a, a imaging. We, do, we establish a, a baseline MRI brain, chest, abdomen, pelvis. The reason we do the brain is that we're looking for meningiomas. Uh, typically, meningiomas are a slow-growing tumor um, in the general population, but we know for BAP1 patients, they can be aggressive um, and they can be more malignant. Um, and then with a chest, abdomen, and pelvis, we're looking for the other tumors, including mesothelioma of the pleura, and also in the abdomen and renal cell carcinoma. Then we also offer MRIs of the breast and mammographies if you're age over 40 uh, to look for breast cancer. And we do the skin and eye exams on an annual basis and the imaging every two years. Most, more recently, we um, implemented cystoscopies because we are seeing that about a 10% risk of bladder cancer in our patient population. So we have screening cystoscopies as well to look for bladder cancer. So this is a little bit old slide. Um, as of right now, we have about 144 patients that have enrolled. And this is, uh, obviously this is old as well, but we've, we've uh, determined patients, we've seen patients with mesothelioma and renal cell carcinoma and other solid tumors. The more common are non-melanomatous non skin cancers, including basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinomas, and also benign um, lesions called BAPOMAs or BIMTs. So this uh, slide I really want to focus on because um, 
you know, a lot of patients ask us, well, you know, are we at risk for developing multiple cancers? Um, and what is the risk uh, over the, their lifetime? So uh, we are seeing um, there is an increased risk of multiple cancers. We don't know the exact uh, frequency, but we have seen some patients develop either two to up to six different primary cancers. And um, I illustrate here one such example. This is a patient who ended up developing six different cancers uh, in the course of their lifetime. Uh, they initially had melanoma, which was um, treated with surgery. In 2014, they developed this pleural nodule, if you see here on the right-hand side in the CT scan. You see this nodule at near the um, front of the chest. Uh, this turned out to be pleural mesothelioma, and they were treated with chemotherapy and surgery. And they've been pretty stable on immunotherapy. In 2017, they had this, this nodule here that was bright on the PET scan, and this turned out actually to be breast cancer. And so this was a second uh, type of can a third type of cancer that developed, and this did require surgery and more chemotherapy that was directed to the breast cancer. More recently, they developed recurrent um, bladder cancers. Typically, these are superficial. They're not the invasive type that invade into the muscle, which are more aggressive, but they can reoccur. And so they do require um, frequent surveillance, cystoscopies, um, even treatments in the bladder, including chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So in conclusion, this, sir, this uh, protocol that we've developed, it's one of the first prospective imaging and clinical screening studies for BAP1 patients. We know BAP1 patients are at risk for several co-occurring malignancies. We know that the management of BAP1 really involves a multidisciplinary team. As I said, we, we involve our surgeons um, and our pathologists, genetic counseling. Um, we do offer cascade testing for patients and their family members who are at risk. And it does, a long, it does involve a long-term follow-up. The goal of this study eventually is to define the lifetime risk of developing these cancers in the setting of BAP1 and eventually develop standard surveillance pr protocols and treatment guidelines. I would like to acknowledge our patients and family members. You've been a great asset. Um, our team at the Thoracic and GI Malignancies Branch, Dr. Rafid Hassan is the PI, Maria Agra, Kathy Wagner, Ted and Maglo, our nurse practitioner, and Alex, our genetic counselor, and also our thor thoracic surgery branch at the NCI. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions, so thank you very much.